Hey, well, so thanks for joining in for the dynamic session of the Civil FE uh, 2021 Civil FE Review. And we are just going to jump in here with uh, dynamic. So this is where things start to move a little bit. I, I had this idea of like getting some effect on here where like my head would be a bobblehead, but that would just annoy you and me. So um, we're not going to do that. So, but tonight we are going to talk about some things like kinematics, mass moment of inertia, force acceleration, work energy, power. Honestly, this is only four to six questions on the test. So I'm not going to hit it maybe as hard as I have some of the other topics. Uh, but I am going to hit some of uh, maybe the main, the main points. I, I, you know, there's, there's so much we could do here. And part of that is when you start looking at the FE reference handbook, the dynamic section is one of those sections where it's shared with mechanical. So when we get into the FE reference handbook, and let me just pull it up here. Um, there's so many different sections of this, specifically with dynamics, right? So there's the basic, 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 the basic uh, particle kinematics, where it's just a, a point moving and, and that sort of thing, you know. And this is where we get into maybe some vector notation. And whether you took a, a calculus-based or a, a, an algebra-based version of your physics class, maybe depends on how you saw this, okay? So this is going to be, you know, there's some basic coordinate systems that we're going to deal with, but these basic relationships between acceleration, speed, and distance, uh, you know, and the derivatives uh, between them are, are going to be important as we go through here. But then you see those equations start showing up in multiple places. So you see, you know, some other types of um, unit vectors here for for other types of systems but right we, we start with Cartesian but then we could have radial transverse um, components for planar motion there's there's obviously other pieces here but these basic equations of, of rectilinear motion are kind of where we're going with a lot of this okay so this is going to be you know your velocity equals your initial velocity plus your acceleration times your time so we're going to get into that with some of these questions um, we're going to take a look at curvilinear motion right so not everything goes in a straight line and you have to start looking uh, at, at your your curves and, and um, your your polar coordinates and that sort of thing so we're not going to get super crazy far into that um, this brings back into vectors I was just looking at the math section again for another reason here but um, those vectors are gonna could potentially show up here plain circular motion again this idea of omega and you have ang angular velocity so these different components are, are going to show up um, and it's just kind of thinking like well what are the basics for like a civil you know a civil engineer to know so we, we uh, when I put these problems together I tried to do them kind of with that in mind where it, it's you know if we if we scroll out here look bigger picture we have some constant acceleration equations. I, I threw those in um, some constant acceleration, whether it's linear or it's angular. Uh, I threw those in because I, th I think those could get, you know, those are fair game. Projectile motion, very fair game. I, I think that's very fair game on the civil test. Um, and then we get into particle kinetics where now we're looking at forces as well. So we have to look at, you know, the force equals mass times acceleration. And that acceleration is going to look a little bit different depending on whether it's linear motion or it's curved motion. Uh, but but it's kind of this basic idea of force equals mass times acceleration. It's either tangential, right, or it's it's a normal acceleration. So you have to uh, look into that. And then there's this principle of work and energy where kinetic and potential has to be consistent. Uh, you know, and if you add work to the system, um, that's gonna that's gonna you know it has to be factored in as well. So that's kind of the big picture right because when we come back to the NCS spec uh, we have kinematics those, those particles rigid, rigid bodies mass moments of inertia that didn't show up yet but we'll see that in a minute uh, or in one of the problems here we have uh, force and acceleration and then again that can be linear or it could be curved and then work on energy power okay so these are just some of those topics where maybe you haven't taken a dynamics class since like you were a sophomore maybe you've never taken a dynamics class in your life okay and all, all you've seen is physics so it's like uh, how do we fit all this into like an hour for four to six questions right so what's going to be most important that's always what I kind of struggle with on, the, on these reviews is what's going to be most important and kind of what needs to be you know what needs to be talked about the most or discussed the most and, and that's where um, feedback is, is always good too it's like hey like this topic would have been helpful to go through that type of thing I don't want specific questions I know there's issues with that and I don't want 
Um, I don't want uh, specific questions, but if, if there's feedback like, hey, we really should have gone over potential energy more, you know, that, that type of thing, um, I, I, can, I can focus there some too. And then there's momentum. But again, as we start looking at this dynamic section, it just keeps going and going. Um, there's some friction things. We'll talk a little bit about friction as well. But then there's it's just there's 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 more there's mass moment of inertia. Um, we'll get into mass moment of inertia just a little bit. That's it's it's similar uh, to your moment of inertia for your structural problems that we we took a look at in the static section. So it, there's some similarities that we'll talk about, we'll discuss, and we have a problem for that. Uh, we'll talk about uh, some of these other pieces here, but kind of the the idea of this mass moment of inertia times your angular velocity squared over two is going to give you. Um, a, a basic change in kinetic energy. So, so we'll look at that. Uh, could we have conservation of, of momentum? Sure. But again, this, this dynamic section is a very robust section because it's meant for mechanicals as well. So the Emmys are going to be getting into more pieces of the dynamics than you're going to need to know for, for, civ for civil, right? So you're not going to need to know torsional vibration. Uh, I was talking to a guy that does something similar, an FE review course similar. And, and, um, he was saying like, Oh, he was like, well, in the civil, did they get into dynamics? I was like, no, or, um, into, into vibrations. I was like, no, he's like, Oh, good. <laughs> you know, cause like dyna or, um, vibrations can be uh, another, another whole mess in itself. But, but again, we see this, this table here for mass moment of inertia. That's very similar to what we saw in like the static section for area moment of inertia. Right. So this is one of those things that you have to know is there and um, know how to use it. So we'll, we'll go through a problem with that. And then we get to mechanics and materials. So um, without kind of going through the whole uh, everything even further here, let's just jump in, work some problems, kind of follow the same format we've done the past uh, few sessions. And uh, hopefully we'll all learn something. So um, as we get going here, let me just uh, go to the first problem. So if you don't have these problems, there's a link down below. Uh, you can download them, but hopefully if you're, you've made it this far, uh, you've seen those problems before. So the vehicle's moving uphill at a speed of 30 miles an hour. And, and you might be thinking like, wait, this is a transportation question, Matson. And it sort of is, but it sort of isn't. And I, and I want to tweak this question a little bit to, to get you thinking a little bit and to talk. Because I, I want to clarify something too, maybe from the transportation uh, section when I was talking about yellow stoplights and that sort of thing. But let's just look at this question for a second. Purely dynamic sense. Vehicle moving uphill at a speed of 30 miles an hour in a grade. So what do we have? We've got a 2% grade, and that looks like a steep 2%, but let's say we have 2% grade, and this vehicle is going up on it, right? So we've got uh, a vehicle here, and, you know, this is a nice cartoon vehicle. Uh, but it's going uphill at, what, we, we said 30 miles an hour, and we have a deceleration, so a braking deceleration that could be confusing, but it's just a, a negative acceleration. You're not going faster, you're getting slower of 10 feet per second squared, right? How long is it going to take this thing to stop, right? So when we take a look at something like this, we want to take a look at acceleration, okay? So um, in, in this case, I'm going to sort of go through a little bit here of, of what the acceleration is, but basically we're going to get a combination of braking acceleration, right? And so when we put on the brakes, we get this 10 feet per second, right? That's what this 10 feet per second is here. That's the, the braking acceleration is 10 feet per second squared. Okay. So, so that's pretty straightforward. Um, but when we look at this, this is also at a grade. So uh, we're going to have some component uh, of gravity here. We're going to have a gravity acceleration that's acting kind of against us, right? Since we're going uphill, uh, that gravity is going to slow us down a little bit as well right so i mean if you think of if you think of the gravity vector right so we've got we've got this gravity vector that's that's pointing down right what's it's um it's what nine here's g right but when we take a look at this slope and i'm going to exaggerate it a little bit right what do we know that we have well what we have here is uh we have some component that's i'm going to call ax and i'm going to call this a y right so ax acts along that plane to slow us down as well. So this is going to be the gravity component because now we're on a slope. If we were completely flat, we, we could just, you know, the AX component would go away. Well, what is the AX component? This is where we kind of have to look at our similar triangles a little bit. Um, we know that for every two feet, we have a hundred feet. So we get a hypotenuse here of, 
good grief. I got like 100.02 feet, right? So so if you look at, if you just use Pythagorean's theorem, you can get 100.02 here. It's, it's really basically the same as 100. So for small angles, uh, what we see is this theta is kind of... Eh, what we see is is for small angles, and maybe I'll put it this way, for small theta, what do we know? We know that the, the cosine, I'm sorry, um, the sine of theta is approximately equal to the opposite, right? It, it's, it's basically, um, how, how do I put that? It's like, uh, ba basically, well, let's just let's do it out here for a second. Opposite over hypotenuse um, equals what? It equals two over a one hundred point zero two, which is basically the same as two over a hundred. This is basically y you get back to your zero point zero two or two percent, right? So that's where in some of the transportation questions you'll see g times g. So the little g, you know, uh, which is gravity times big g, which is the grade. And we can kind of make that approximation for because theta is generally pretty small. I mean, normally you're not getting more than like a six, seven, eight percent grade on a road. Okay, so this gravity we have to deal with is essentially going to be what? It's going to be our 32.2 feet per second squared times times g, right? So times or this grade 0 0.02, which is going to equal with that 0 0.644. I ran out of room here, so let me just move this over a little bit. Uh, does that work? Sure, it's feet per second squared. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to add that in our total acceleration. It is going to equal, when we sum these two up, what's that? 10.644. And maybe you never did that in your your transportation class, but that's your that, that ends up being your total de deceleration, right? So once we have an, a constant acceleration, this this gets to be kind of one of those easy things. Hopefully, it gets to be easy in the sense that we can come back, you know, to our uh, to our constant acceleration equations here, right? We have a constant acceleration equation, and we can say, well. I, if I know I have a constant acceleration, what am I trying to find? I'm trying to find the time it takes to stop, right? So I can say, well, I can use this constant acceleration equation and come back here and say, uh, you know, we can use the essentially what I'm going to call the velocity equation. You could integrate this too, um, you know, for constant. Man, it always surprises me how I can spell wrong while writing, you know, I think for constant acceleration. Okay, so velocity equation for constant acceleration. This tells us that V equals essentially V naught, uh, you know, plus A, uh, A naught T. And this actually, this equation shows up a little bit differently in the manual or the reference handbook. It shows up here where it's, it's rearranged V naught plus A naught times T minus T naught. T naught's going to be zero, so that goes away. So it just becomes kind of V naught. Uh, plus a naught times t. Okay, um, this this equation also does show up. I think uh, maybe kind of you know here as well. There's a v squared. It's uh, you know this here it is directly v equals v naught plus a a naught t. Okay, so same equation. Uh, it shows up in a couple different places. It, it, a little bit differently, but um, what we know is at some time t, at some time t we're gonna have zero feet per second. Okay, and when we start, we have 30 miles per hour, which if you remember our conversions, our conversions, do you remember how many feet are in a mile? Um, we're going to have 5280 feet. And if you don't know where that is, you can go search it in the reference handbook. That's 5280 feet per mile uh, times uh, every one hour you have 3600 seconds. Right, and this also is where you get that like 1.47 term uh, in a lot of those equations, those uh, transportation e equations. Um, so let's keep going here. So, so we do this, and what else do we do? So this is our, this is kind of well, actually, let me let me back up. Um, yeah, so this is our v naught term, right? And then what we have to do here is we have to add our acceleration of 10.64. Uh, feet per second squared times our time. 
okay? So this just becomes kind of a basic equation. It's a it's kind of simplified now once you get your unit conversions in there. It's just we have to, you know, put one to the other side. Honestly, we could say because this is kind of absolute units, we could say this is negative because it's slowing down, right? It's, it's slowing down. Um, so we could call it a negative acceleration, a deceleration. Uh, you know, we could, we could do it however you want. But basically all that we have left here is to solve for T. Okay, so T is going to equal, if we take essentially 30 times 1.47, that gets us about 45 divided by 10.64. And that's going to get us to, I think, about 4.13 seconds. Okay, so that gets us to answer C. Now, before I go too far, I just want to say, Eugenia, um, if, if we get, if you pass this to, you know, I love, reach out to me. We'll, we'll do an interview, all right? Um, but let's go. Let's keep going here. So I, I just want to come back to transportation for a second because I think I, when I was talking about, a uh, yellow stop time in the transportation section at one point. I, I don't think I, I, I said it perfectly right, and I, I kind of want to come back here. So let's come back here and take a look at this yellow stop time. Okay, so if we come back to yellow traffic signal, what do we get? We get uh, this yellow signal equation. And you'll notice it's T, which is kind of the perception reaction time, so that's a standard of kind of one one second then you get this acceleration in here of you know in, in our case we're saying 10 uh you know plus that g term but you'll notice there's this extra two in there and if we come back to to, to this this equation um we don't see a over two okay so what's the difference well the difference is this is a transportation equation <laughs> It's set up for transportation purposes. Uh, but the other thing that I, I, I just wanted to be clear here, um, this is your perception reaction time. This is actually the time it takes for a vehicle to, to safely go through the intersection at the speed limit if they just missed the yellow. Does that make sense? So in other words, um, this yellow time, if, if we're to look at you know, a timeline here, you know, and we have the, the, the stoplight down here and, you, and your car is traveling you know, this way, uh, right, so your car is traveling. The yellow time is going to be some time where, if you know, this is kind of this the yellow time. There's going to be this time where, if we work this out for the same numbers and using that equation, we're going to get a yellow time of about t. I'm going to well, actually, let me just call it yellow. Um, I'm going to say this yellow time is about it's. Uh, where did I have it? I had it somewhere. Um, hold on. Let me see if I have that number. I, I think I did the number out ahead of time. It, it was a little over three seconds. So that yellow time is a little over, it's about 3.1 seconds. And you might be thinking, but wait, it takes four point, you know, point one seconds to stop. So what gives, right? Um, and this is known as kind of that, like in between. This is the this is the dilemma zone, right? I'm gonna make it red. It's not really a red signal, but this is this is what's known as like the dilemma zone. This is the the time where um, you're you're kind of past, you know, stopping at a normal deceleration rate, but you also you kind of don't know what to do. So that's where it's like you have this dilemma of do I stop and take four seconds to stop, or you know, or not, or, or if I, if I see the yellow light, like right, you know, right in here, for example, right before that three seconds, well, what do I do? And it's sort of that dilemma because you don't actually have enough safe distance to stop, right? This is time so that if you travel at 30 miles an hour, you can actually get through the intersection. Okay. You can enter the intersection before, uh, before the yellow light goes, turns to red. So that's safe, right? But the dilemma zone is where it's it's if it's if you have too long of a dilemma zone, you 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 have cars entering the intersection, potentially getting right angle collisions, um, or you know stopping too late and, and and not getting there, or trying you know trying to speed through it. So so there's that dilemma zone, and I just wanted to point that out because this equation here, right? This equation a over t is based on pure physics. Uh, it, it's based on on the actual you know time it takes to stop with a constant acceleration this is this this yellow time and, and this is where i want just wanted to bring that try to bring that clarification that extra two kind of it makes it so that, that that's the time to safely pass through the intersection uh if if you're going at the same speed so hopefully i didn't confuse anybody too much there but 
Um, maybe I could do a separate video just on that, uh, you know, once we get through the FD review. So hopefully that makes sense. And let's keep going because the next question is, again, it's constant acceleration. It's going to hit on some of the same topics, but it takes it kind of to a different level. And because we're used to going on lines, especially civil, it's like everything's a straight line. Uh, but now... In question two, we have a disc that's rotating. I should have made this like a merry-go-round or something. I don't know, but we have a disc that's rotating. And let me draw my disc in here. So um, basically, we have a disc. I haven't mastered drawing a perfect circle yet. Uh, maybe one of you have. But um, what do we have? We have we have two things that are happening. We have we have a time of two seconds and an angular velocity of 12 radians per second. Okay, so what does that look like? Well, I'm just going to draw that that in here that the time two, we have omega two of 12 radians per second. And actually, maybe I should even say, maybe I should just write this in where time two, um, I'm gonna say equals two seconds. So at time two seconds, we took a measurement and we got 12 radians per second, okay? And uh, so, yeah, so we're the, the the disc is rotating clockwise. We're good. Okay, at another time here. Okay, at another time. At time, uh, you know, four equals four seconds. We have a, an angular velocity omega four equals uh, nine radians per second. Right. So what we have is some deceleration uh, uh, stopping this thing. It could be, a, you know, a break, friction break, breaking this. It could be uh, another type of break that, you, you know, you sit out here and you, you, you start to break this thing at some particular rate. It could be a clutch, you know, just just keeping it from rotating. So the question is, this one, we don't have the acceleration, but uh, we're told that we have a constant acceleration. And that constant is gonna be huge here. Because if it's not a constant acceleration, uh, then you have to start integrating or taking derivatives, right? But here we have a constant uh, acceleration. So what we can do is we can come back to our, our basic dynamics equations here and hopefully solve some of this, right? So uh, what we see here is our constant acceleration for rectilinear motion. Uh, we have polar coordinates. I don't wanna get into polar coordinates. Um, what I want to do is I want to look for something with uh, omega here and specifically as I keep coming down here I get constant angular acceleration equations for angular velocity and displacement are you got alpha omega and theta right and I uh, it's I mean this isn't funny but uh, my kids were learning Greek my wife just said you gotta learn Greek like for you know whatever and they were learning the Greek alphabet and and I was actually surprised at how many Greek letters I knew just from engineering. I never, you know, learned Greek. So, it, so if this seems confusing to you, don't worry. It's all Greek to me, also. Um, so it is, it is, it is Greek. But it's um, one of those things where you start to learn these letters and you realize, oh wait, I, I do know something. So let's take a look at this omega equation and bring it in. Okay. So if I if I come back over here and I say uh, omega t uh, equals what alpha naught times t minus t naught uh, plus omega naught, right? So that's kind of where we're starting. Well, one of the things is um, we don't know omega naught, right? So we don't know omega naught. We don't know alpha naught. So is this where you just like, uh, throw up your hands and say, I'm done with dynamics. I've only got four questions. I'm just gonna flag them all anyway and just come back to them. Well, there's four to six. So if you can get a couple of these, it's even better. So, so but what we do know is we have two points, right? So what we could say here is, well, we know that omega of, let's say two, or no, let's, let's use four. I've got four in my notes. So if we say omega four equals what? It equals uh, nine radians per second. That's going to equal alpha naught times t minus t zero. So let's say we're going to say four minus, let's say four seconds minus two seconds, you know, plus uh, nine radians per second. So this omega naught doesn't need to be at time zero. It can be at time two, right? But but what we what we ended up with is, is now one equation that we can solve for this alpha naught, right? So we can solve for alpha naught equals, well, four minus two is two, uh, what do we do? Oh, I wrote something wrong in here. Which one is? Oh, this should be 12, right? So this is our, our we're going to say, we're going to say T naught um, equals T2 and omega naught 
equals omega two here, right? So we're gonna we're gonna we're just gonna define that for this equation, and that's where we get our twelve radians per second here. Okay. So what are we gonna get? We're gonna get um, essentially nine minus twelve is gonna be. Um, 9 minus 12 is, is going to be minus 3 radians per second. And then we're going to divide all this by what? Four, 4 seconds minus 2 seconds. So divide by 2 seconds. And we're going to get minus 1.5 radians per second squared. So again, we're getting that, that unit of kind of a distance or an angular distance uh, divided by a second per second. So radians per second, it, it decreases 1.5 radians per second every second. Okay, so now we have our acceleration. And what we want to know is, is how long is it going to take this thing to stop? So we have our equation of omega t equals alpha naught times t minus t zero plus omega naught, right? But the problem is we still don't have, uh, we still don't have omega naught. So we still have to kind of use this definition up here that we de defined, right? So we're still going to have to use t naught as this t two time. But what we do know is, is when it comes to a complete stop, it's going to be zero radians per second. Okay, so that has to equal minus 1.5 times t. So we don't know what that t is, but we're going to subtract off two seconds from it. And then we're going to add in this 12 uh, radians per second over here. Right, so what do we get? Well, uh, good grief. Um, let's, let's just break this down a little bit. So... I'm going to take this over to the right hand side. I'm going to get 1.5 times t minus 2 seconds equals 12 radians per second. Uh, so if I divide both sides by 1.5, what's that? 12 divided by 1.5? I think that's 8. Right? So I get t minus 2 seconds equals 8 radians uh, per second. I think my units are off here somewhere because this is a. Um, radian per second squared is my acceleration, right? So we're left with, essentially we're left with uh, eight seconds. And we have to remember this two seconds on the, the left hand side. So we get a total time of um, 10 seconds. Okay, so that's gonna be uh, our answer here. Okay, but again, it, sometimes you're given the acceleration, sometimes you have to solve it. I thought this would be a good way to kind of just throw that one out there. Um, where you're using these equations, uh, if you if you use, if you use omega is four and, um, and, I'm sorry, time four and omega nine, you do get the same answer. Actually, that's the way I did it in my notes, but then I started down this path with, with T naught of, of two and, and omega naught of, 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 um, of, of 12. And it, both ways you get the same answer. Okay, because the one, um, you start with the nine and you, you end up adding four back to it. So it's like six plus four versus, you know, eight plus two down here. So you still end up with uh, the same the same value. But that's that one. I mean, not, hopefully nothing too crazy and it, it makes some sense. All right. Well, let's keep going to question number three. We only got eight questions tonight. So this one might be my record for shortness. I, I don't know, but we'll see. So question three, what do we have? This is where, uh, you know, I, I had to bring in, I couldn't just do a, a projectile was fired. I had to make a dirt bike at a carnival. Okay. So what are we doing? We have a, we have a, we have this, you know, carnival floor and we've got a ramp that comes up and another ramp that comes down and your job as the engineer is to figure out, okay, what speed does he have to go exactly so that he can nail this and not, you know, not like come up short. So, so basically we want, we want this, this guy on the bike or girl on the bike, you know, whoever it is at, at, as it gets launched off, right? We want them to come down right in the same spot, right? Uh, and not, not come down too short or not go way too far and uh, and, and, and uh, have some issues, right? So, so either, anything of a perfect here um, is gonna result in a problem. So what, do, I, I mean, short is probably worse than long, but let's just, what we're trying to figure out here is, what do we know? We have an, an angle of 20 degrees and we have 17.5 meters per second. So this rider can lock in at 17.5 meters per second 
right and they're gonna launch off a ramp we got two ramps and we want to know your job your first task as an engineer is to figure out X don't screw it up we don't want anybody dying today okay so what do we have we want to figure out how far that distance is right so what do we have to figure out well when we think about this we think okay this this rider is gonna be in the air for a certain amount of time and the nice thing is when we were looking at our equations in the reference handbook I think it's on the next page here we have it we have a whole sheet on uh, projectile motion so the good news is uh, we know that our we're gonna assume that our, our acceleration in the X direction is zero so it's gonna he's gonna stay the same rate kind of going across uh, the velocity in the X direction is going to be kind of the, the initial velocity times the cosine of this theta right, right this X distance look we have a we have a formula for X which is amazing so so basically we just need to solve for X right and that's it but the problem with this formula we know be not we don't know T what's T the T is how long the the rider is going to be in the air so we have to solve for that distance T and in order to do that we can use one of two equations we can either use this velocity equation or uh, our, our y equation uh, honestly either one of these equations is going to work uh, they end up being basically the same thing but let me sh I'm going to start with just this y equation right because uh, what's y the, the y equation tell us well if we set you know this distance like the top of the ramp y equals zero what we know is we're going to come up to some peak here and then back to you know we're going to start at zero and we're going to come back down to zero so if we use that equation uh, what we're, we're going to say is let's do this let's let's first solve uh, for the time in the air right that's going to be our the time that we want to figure out so what we know is we can use this equation we can say well y equals minus g t squared over 2 uh, plus v naught uh, times the sine of theta times t plus y naught okay you might be saying well why are you using that one well i i want to show you something real quick like right the, this is the the y equation we know what y is at two points we know y equals zero at the beginning and at the end does that make sense i mean this is just a, a parabolic function so so if we set y equal to zero here right we can say well zero um, equals minus gravity times this time over two plus our, our velocity times our sine of theta times our time plus our y naught well we already we already said y naught is going to be zero also so what are we left with basically we're left with this equation where we say zero equals minus well actually let me do this i'm just going to factor out a t i'm going to say t times minus g t over two plus v naught sine theta and what do you notice about this equation here this equation is very 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 similar uh to uh this equation up, up here right this is our, our y velocity y equation Right, we get that extra factor over two because basically if we set velocity equal to zero the y velocity we'd find the y the x distance kind of the time when it hit its peak but if we set the y distance equal to zero we're going to find the time it takes to go twice the peak and, and basically back to the same point so i, I kind of like using that y distance formula a little bit better because it's not really that much harder you know it's it's just you have to recognize that yeah y is going to equal zero at the beginning at time equals zero and at some other time when you know this this component equals zero so if i just factor this now and solve for minus gt over two plus v naught sine theta um, i'm going to be good right so basically i'm just taking this one factor and, and solving it because if that one factor goes to zero the whole thing goes to zero okay so uh what do we know well we know i'm going to put the gt over two on the left hand side so i'm going to say minus 9.81 meters per second squared all over two times our time is going to equal um, v naught and, and let me write in my v naught what did we say this was going to be 17.5 meters per second times our sine of i think it was 20 degrees okay so the only unknown here uh, is the time so that's that's a, that's a good thing so if we say 17.5 uh, 
times the sine of, well actually let me do 7.5 divided by, I'm going to do that divided by, oh no it's 7.5 times the sine of 20, sorry, I'm not looking at my, 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 my uh, sheet nicely enough here, so 7.5 divided by 20, or um, good grief, I can't see it, 17.5 times the sine of 20, that's what this is, and then I'm going to multiply both sides by 2, so times 2 and divided by 9.81, I got a time of about 1.2 uh, two, two seconds. So that was the first thing. We know this rider is going to be in the air for, you know, that, that, that 1.22, uh, this, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. This should be, this should be a positive value there, right? Cause we added this to the other side, 100%. So that gets to be positive when we add it to the other side. So what are we going to do? The rider's in the air for one set, 1.2 seconds. And then with the second thing that we're going to do is we're going to do, we're going to just use, you know, solve, for the distance x right so this is where we can come back and get that equation again and that equation uh, is right here it's the distance x is going to equal v naught cos theta t plus x naught so let me just write that in here so this distance uh, x equals um, v naught cos theta t plus uh, x naught. And just like we defined kind of y equals zero, uh, we're going to define kind of this x, this x position is going to be zero. x equals zero at the beginning, you know, y equals zero um, all the way across here. And it, don't get confused. I mean, this is still like our y axis and our x axis, right? But this is kind of like the y equals zero line, if, if you will. Okay, so what are we going to do next? We're going to say, well, x equals zero because we're at the beginning. So we're trying to solve for this x. So we're gonna say x equals v naught, which is 17.5 meters per second times the cosine of 20, 20 degrees times that 1.22 seconds. And hopefully x gives us one of the answers up above because that would be really sad if it didn't. But uh, 70.5 times the cosine of 20 times, I got to get my extra parentheses in there, times 1.22, and I got about 20.06 uh, if, if I did that right. So 20.06, and we're going to tell them, okay, go a little bit faster than 17.5, so you make sure you make it. But yeah, I mean, it should be right in that right in that range of about 20, about 20 meters. So somebody could argue, well, I'm going to put it at 19 meters to make sure that it doesn't fall short. And you know, I wouldn't blame you. Uh, <laughs> I'd probably do it like 19.5 or something. So, so yeah, I mean, basically that gets us most nearly to 20 meters. Okay. Uh, it's not a perfect answer, but it's, it's a pretty close answer. So, I don't know, makes sense, but, uh, but I, hope it, I hope it makes sense. Basically, with projectile motion, a lot of times what you're going to be doing is you're going to be using some combination of that, right? You're going to have to either figure out a y value, a, a velocity, or an, I mean, the acceleration values are, are always going to be given here, right? They're, they're really not going to change. So the biggest thing that you're going to have to do is, well, are you figuring out, you know, the distance to the peak? Are you just figuring out the time for this whole, you know, the whole thing? Um, if, you have, if you want the, the time to peak, right, you're just going to take... Uh, you're going to set your velocity equal to zero. When does the velocity equal zero? It equals zero when you're at your, well, when your y velocity equals zero when it, when it caps out. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, that, that's kind of like, you know, maybe you could start at a, at a point up here. If you started at a point up here, and now you're going to have to deal with this y naught term, or you're going to have to deal with this x naught term, right? So, there, there's only so many ways you can rearrange these equations, but they're in there for you and hopefully they help you when you get a, a question like this and you can go ahead and solve it. All right, so let's keep going. Uh, let's keep going. Question four. This is another one of those questions that it looks a lot like a tra traffic question and I, you know, I tried to throw in some, tra some questions like this that look a lot like traffic questions, transportation questions, but they're actually dynamics questions, right? So here we're looking at vehicle A, we've got vehicle A, I'm going to just maybe make vehicle A a color here. So vehicle A, the good guy is green. Okay, I don't know, I always use green as positive. But, and then we got what vehicle B is, let's draw vehicle B in here. This is vehicle B. 
and they're both traveling at certain speeds here. So one is at 90 kilometers an hour and 172 kilometers an hour, and, and they're basically merging out of this, uh, this, this highway. So vehicle A is just driving, travel along, going at normal speed. Uh, vehicle B is coming around the curve, a little bit slower than vehicle A. You can see vehicle B is actually a little bit ahead of vehicle A. They're 125 meters out, so they're more than a football field out. And what's going to happen? Well, vehicle A just is driving, going steady, got it on cruise, not screwing around and just, you know, they're going. So the question is, where is vehicle A going to be when vehicle B hits this point of tangent? Uh, is there, you know, is this car, are they going to hit each other? Is vehicle A going to be a fair distance in front of vehicle B or just a little bit in front? All right, so fair distance in front versus a little bit in front. So let's figure that out basically we have to figure out well how how long does it take vehicle a to go this distance or however far actually what we want to do first let me back up what we want to do is we want to figure out how long it's going to take vehicle b to get to point the the point of tangency so how long is it going to take vehicle b to get there and then once we know that time um we can take uh, we can take the next step and say well okay vehicle b is traveling this much distance to get to the point of tangency okay uh, vehicle A, how long does it take vehicle A or how far can vehicle A travel in that same amount of time? Does that make sense? So before we even get started on anything else, I'm just going to jump in here and anytime I see something in kilometers an hour and it's like a, it's a, it's a speed type of question, I'm going to convert to meters per second. Okay, so I'm going to convert the speeds to meters per second and that's where I'm going to start here. So I'm going to take my 90 kilometers an hour right and I'm gonna multiply by some conversions so so these conversions if you're taking the FE should be kind of second nature but what one kilometer per 1000 meters and uh, for every one hour we have 3600 seconds and when we do that what do we get we get 90 uh, times 1000 divided by 3600 and I got 25 meters per second. So actually, I did that on purpose just to make it a nice number for you. Uh, you know, just that I, I don't try to make your life miserable with these questions. I, I hope that they actually are a little bit of fun. Uh, they're, they're not too crazy. But what do we do next? It's okay. Uh, we, do, we do the same thing here. 1,000 meters per one kilometer, you know, times one hour over 3600 seconds and honestly on the test you might not write all this out I'm writing it out just because I, I want you to see where it comes from and I, I want to be uh, clear but you know there are some ways to save some time like just repeat enter in your calculator and just change the 90 to 72 right and so here we have our, our two speeds okay the next thing that I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say well okay let's find let's step two find the time it takes, uh, time you know for vehicle B to reach the point of tangency, right? So, so basically, the way this question is, is it's saying when when the center of vehicle B arrives at the point of tangency. So all these measurements are kind of from the point of tangent or from the center of the particle, so to speak. Even though it's a bigger than a particle, it's we're kind of dealing with this kind of like. Uh, kinematics okay so we're saying this is kind of like particle even though it's a 2,500 kilogram vehicle okay so let's say that we have this vehicle here and how long is it going to take well we know that it's ta that it's it's traveling at 20 meters per second and what else do we know well we know that uh, kind of we have these equations of of you know of, of distance equals the velocity times t minus t naught right so if we have a if we don't have any acceleration going on we kind of know that this this distance is going to be some velocity times the time and we have a velocity here and we actually have a distance too so if we know uh if we know that this curve they're going 30 degrees on this curve right what do we know we also know that that we have uh, are we told this? Yeah, we have a, a ramp with a radius of 210 meters. So this radius here, right, this radius, uh, if we kept going, you know, it would be 210 meters. So, so, so if we take 30 degrees of that, basically the distance traveled, then uh, let me write it like this, the arc distance 
traveled, right, is going to be what? Do you remember this? This comes from that circular curve kind of formula as, as well. But basically, it, it's going to be uh, the theta times the radius, right? So, so what are we going to get here? We're going to get well, the theta is going to be 30 degrees, but we can't use degrees here. That's where we have to, if, if you go back to that uh, transpose equation, we're going to times pi over 180 right times the radius of 210 meters okay so this is kind of like if you if you if you take a look back actually I mean I could just go show it to you real quick but if we come back to transportation here and ah, let me go to environmental and work my way back here uh, so if I come back to the horizontal curves right uh, this is kind of that we, we've done it in the transportation section I think we did it in the surveying section but this 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 uh, arc length is the radius times that angle times pi over 180. Okay, so it's that same equation uh, that we get to deal with here, and that's going to give us some distance, right? So that's going to give us a distance that this car has traveled, right? So this distance that the car is traveling uh, to go from where it is now up to the plane of tangent is going to be I don't even know if I worked this out, but it's going to be pi over six. Uh, times 210 that's 35 pi okay 35 pi or about 110 uh, meters okay so it's a distance and I guess the question is how long does it take a car traveling 20 meters per second to travel that distance right so, so all that we're going to do now is we're going to kind of plug in down here and we say okay well we have a distance of 110 meters that's going to equal 20 meters per second Times some time and we're again we're going to kind of throw out this time zero we're going to find that as is the initial time the time that this snapshot is taken is zero so what do we get we get a time for it to travel that far of 110 divided by 20 and 110 divided by 20 I think that's 5.5 yeah 5.5 seconds at 5.5 5.5 seconds from the current snapshot that car B is going to be at the point of tangency up here okay so at t so so this is kind of like this picture up here is kind of like t equals zero seconds okay that's this picture the next picture that we're going to draw though is going to be well what happens at t equals 5.5 seconds right so the next picture that we have up here i probably should have drawn another diagram but uh, basically let's draw that diagram in now right because now we have this road right and we have this art coming in uh, and, and basically what we see here is that at 5.5 seconds, vehicle B is at this point, right? So this is vehicle B. And vehicle A is somewhere else. Where's vehicle A? So, so vehicle B is, is, is right at, the, at that PT, right? So if this, is, if this is PT, right, that's where vehicle B is. Where's vehicle A? And, and that's what we want to figure out. So uh, let's do this. Let's say so we found the, the time. Let's say three is going to be find the, the distance traveled by traveled by vehicle A. Right. So so again, it's it's that same kind of formula here, but we're going to say now we're, we're taking S of T equals V naught times T minus T naught. Right. T naught still zero. But what we have here is we have the distance that A traveled equals what 25 meters per second times 5.5 seconds right because because this is the the speed of vehicle a right this is kind of like the the speed of a this is a right and this is the time that it, the, the same amount of time it took b to get to that point so we're going to get some distance here s of t equal to 25 times 5.5 so 25 times 5.5 is if I know how to use my calculator, it's 137.5 uh, meters. Is that right? 137.5 meters. Okay, so, so basically it, it started here and, and it's gone a total distance of 137.5. And actually, let me move this down just so that we can have some room here to, to draw it in. Uh, the other, uh, you know what I probably could have done? I, I probably could have said, we know that we have 
uh, I, I probably could have written this in. We, we know that we have plus, uh, well, actually, I, I could say minus, I, I could say minus, um, come on, it's not liking me right this second. Um, that wasn't good, that just crashed. Well, let's open it again and hope it works. Okay, so uh, opening it again, uh, and I think it's working here. It's coming back to life. It's just on my second screen. And what we're gonna do is basically we're gonna find that distance um, that it takes. There it is, okay. Sorry, let me get there again, and let's let's take a look here. So what we could have done is we could have said, well, if we're going to define this, let's say we we define this point as x equals zero, right? What does that mean? That means that this distance is kind of like x equals minus one twenty-five. You see that? So we could also come back here and say, well, I'm going to add in kind of like a plus a s naught term here. In other words, I'm going to subtract that 125 off here. And if I subtract that 125, I get s of t uh, equal to 12.5 meters. And that's past. So it's either it's either 137.5, right, from the start, or it's it's 12.5 meters, right, it's 12.5 meters uh, from the point of tangency. So this is our this is our vehicle A. Okay. So let's go see what our question asks, right? Uh, and, and like I said, that's either 137 from this point or 12.5 from the point of tangent. Okay, so either way, you just have to, to, to think of it kind of one way or the other. But what that means is we have this 12.5 meters between the two. That's, you know, 30, 40 feet. Uh, and that's that's not super close. It's not, I mean, it's not super far, but it's not like super, super close. But it's it's probably closer than um, than comfort. So, so what we want to see is the front bumper of B is how far from the back bumper of A. So what's this distance? And to figure out this distance, we have to know that these vehicles are both six meters long. So if they're both six meters long, that's gonna help us here, three meters and three meters. So basically we get 12.5 meters minus three meters times two equals about 6.5 meters. And our answer here, we're gonna say, I'm gonna go with C is about six meters behind uh, the back bumper of vehicle A. So, Again, this question, it's probably a little bit more complicated than uh, a question you'll see on the FE, but it, it gets into that idea of that arc length, it gets into the idea of that velocity or speed equation or distance equation, I should say, is based on velocity times time. It also gets into that, like kind of down here, this idea of kind of relative coordinates where maybe it didn't make sense to define X as, you know, zero at the point up here and this is minus 125 or something like that. And you can figure figure it out from there. So another kind of spin on it, but it, but very similar uh, similar equations. Okay, so that kind of gets us with this idea of kinematics. It's like you you have to get into these these speed velocity acceleration equations or distance velocity acceleration equations, I should say, uh, and kind of some of the iterations of what they look like. And if you can use them, uh, you'll you'll do you'll do great. So Let's keep going uh, because now we get into part B, which says mass moments of inertia. Mass moments of inertia come in uh, into play, especially with work and energy and angular motion and that sort of thing. And that's where this this kind of comes in. So this is kind of like a big pendulum almost. I mean, it's like a, a big hammer. You know, it's like you got this big slender rod over here, and then you got this this heavier mass at the end. And the question, this question, all this question asks for is is you know we have a rod and cylinder. They're welded together to form a rigid assembly. They're supported by a frictionless pin at this point A, and uh, there's a you know two centimeter rod and a ten centimeter uh, cylinder, and the the masses are are given there. So 2.5 kilograms over that whole one meter length uh, versus 12 kilograms all kind of centered in on that the bigger cylinder at the end. 
And what we want is the mass moment of inertia. And the reason we want the mass moment of inertia is because on question eight, we're going to use it. Okay, I originally I think I had this question all together in one question. I'm like, that's just insane. Uh, it's it's like way too much for one question for the FE. But I could see something like this where they even split it up. Uh, honestly, if I were doing a test, I'd want to split it up. But but when we think about this, this question is very, very similar to the area moment of inertia that we did in statics, right? And basically, we're going to use uh, the, the same kind of formula that we had for statics. We're going to say that the moment uh, or the mass moment of inertia about point A, that's what we're, what we're saying. We want the mass moment of inertia about point A is going to equal, well, what do we have? We have the sum of IC or the moment of inertia about the centroid plus instead of AD squared, which is the area formula, we're going to say ML squared. Okay, so this is very, very similar uh, to if, if you think back, right, we have the area uh, moment of inertia of I equals I, uh, or actually it equals sigma I naught plus A D squared. Do you, do you remember that one? I mean that that was that that's just a, a parallel kind of you know formula here, but one is is mass, one's for uh, you know where we're going to be dealing with the, the impact of the mass on the system, and the other one um, we're going to use for uh, for for structures, right? But but basically what we want to do here is we want to solve for this this formula. So if you remember, I kind of like to do these with a table. So uh, I'm going to label my two parts here. I'm going to say, okay, I'm just going to color these in. I'm going to say this is one part. So I'm going to call this maybe one. And then I'm going to call this cylinder two. And maybe I'll make that a different color. I'll make that blue, you know. Uh, but basically, I'm going to break this up into two parts. That's where kind of the sigma comes in. We can break this thing up but then we have to add the, the impacts. And, and when I do that, I like to make a table as well. So I'm gonna say the part, right? I'm just gonna do part one and part two, right? Part one is just uh, this, this rod, you know, part two is gonna be the cylinder. Oops, wrong one. Uh, so I'll do a cylinder here, so that one's the blue one. And what are we gonna do? We're gonna say that we're first gonna find this IC term. So this moment of inertia, the mass moment of inertia about the centroid. And to do that, you'll remember when we first started kind of the session, we were looking up here in the dynamic section. Actually, it's right at the end of the dynamic section. So I'm gonna to go to mechanics and materials and kind of come back. There were some of these, these, these charts here, just like there are, just like in the static section, there's charts so there's there's uh, the same thing for mass moment of inertia here. So what we're looking for is if this is our rod, right? We want to be about the center, and this thing we have to consider that it's going to rotate about the center. So what what moment of inertia do we want? Well, if we were to take the z-axis and kind of bring it over, it's going to rotate in that direction around the center. So I'm going to take my eye. ZC and, and we'll call this ML squared over 12. So let's come back and I'll say uh, I ZC equals ML squared over 12. So what's that? Well, uh, we don't know what the mass is yet. So, well, I guess we do know what the mass. The mass of the rod is 2.5 kilograms times its length of one meter. I'm going to square the length and divide by 12. So I get about 0 0.21 uh, kilogram meter squared. Okay, so that's that's for the the the, uh, the the rod, and then we can come back here and we can look for the same thing for uh, the cylinder. So the cylinder we have a something something here as well, and I Z C right. So we essentially want to rotate this again about I the, the Z axis I Z C here. Uh, that's going to be, it's a slightly different formula. Maybe you're thinking like, but this is a rod and this is a, a cylinder. Are they really that much different? And, and it just has to do with the way the mass is distributed. Um, you know, if you if you do some limits here, you'll, you'll quickly get to the same formula. But uh, basically, we're going to use this formula here. We're going to use uh, this formula. So let me write it in here. And for the cylinder now, we're going to say that IZC uh, equals... Um, m over 12 times 3r squared plus h squared. So, so that has to do with um, you know how the cylinder works. So, so we're going to say that this mass of this the the cylinder is 12 kilograms divided by 12, 
times three times its radius, right? So if we have a 10 centimeter, uh, a 10 centimeter cylinder, we're going to say that well, the radius equals 0. Point, well, let me let me write it like this: the, the radius is going to equal five centimeters or 0 0.05 meters. And I'm going to keep everything consistent in meters here. So times uh, 0 0.05 meters squared plus the height, which is going to be 0 0.2 meters squared. And I think that's everything. So if I do all that out, I'm going to get this equal to, I think it was like something really pretty small. So 12 over 12 is one times three times 0 0.05 squared uh, plus 0 0.2 squared. And I got like 0 0.0475.05 roughly. So not, not very big, you know, 0 0.05 uh, kilogram meters squared. I can add all those up. I can say, well, my sum of ICs equals about 0 0.26 kilogram meters squared. And you might be thinking that's really far from 5.515 or anything else. And that's where this ML squared term comes in, just like the 80 squared and the, the area moment inertia uh, really has an impact this ml squared term does as well. So I'm going to write my m. My m is going to be 2.5 kilograms uh, or 12 kilograms, right? So those were the mass of the two parts. Uh, then the length. The length is a little tricky here in the sense that it, it, you might be tempted to think, well, I'm just going to take the 100 and I'm going to take uh, the 20. But that's not exactly what we're doing. What we're doing is we're doing um, just like the D in this AD squared was from the centroid to the center of where you want your moment of inertia. What we're doing, doing here is we're going to go from the center of this to the, the point of rotation. So this is going to be our length uh, that we're going to use for that center of rotation. And uh, I'm going to call this, uh, so I'm going to move it essentially L over 2 or 0 0.5 meters. Uh, I'm going to move the big cylinder, you know, one meter plus 0.1 meters. So I'm going to move the big cylinder uh, 1.1 meters. And then I'm going to do an ml squared term here. Okay, so ml squared is going to give us uh, the total kind of, you know, it, the, the total mass moment inertia based on that distance away from um, its centroid. So 2.5 times 0.5 squared. It's like 0 0.625, but here's the bigger one. So 12 times 1.1 squared is going to be about 14.5. Uh, so when we add all that up, what I'm going to get here is a value of about 15.15, uh, one, one roughly 1.5 kilograms meters squared. So this is kind of the sum of the ml squared term. Okay. And what we want to do is we want to add those two together to get our total. So this is going to equal our total uh, moment of inertia about point A. So when we do that, um, what we get is IA equals uh, 0 0.26 kilograms uh, meters squared plus 15.15 kilogram uh, meters squared. And we get the total value down here of about 15.4 kilogram meters squared. So mass moment inertia, and honestly, this is really, really similar to area moment inertia. It's just you're using slightly different formulas for these 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 basic areas. You're still kind of looking at centroid of, of part to you know reference point or centroid of the whole thing, depending on what you're where you where you want your moment of inertia. There are other ways to do this, but personally, I'm a fan of uh, I'm a fan of these tables. It's a way to organize your work and try not to forget things. It's so easy to forget things, but uh, you know, some people have big long equations that they like to just plug everything into. I personally am a fan of this table. It's something you kind of have to, to, to memorize a little bit, but it's one of those things that if you learn it for um, your area moment inertia, just throwing it in here is really not too far off. You just have to think about which way is that, is that component rotating? Which axis do I need it to rotate about? And that's the one that I'm going to use. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna highlight here the answer of 15.1 uh, not 15.1 what did I say 15.4 yeah 15.4 and uh, hopefully be happy with it so um, so I think that makes sense okay so let's keep going and uh, we'll go to question question six.
Question six says we have a vehicle with a mass of 1,000 kilograms traveling at 90 kilometers an hour around a curve. So, you know, this could be through a curve. It could be, there could be, uh, this vehicle is at an intersection and it's 90 kilometers an hour. That's probably too fast to go through an intersection. But um, let's just say that we have this vehicle here. It's traveling at 90 kilometers an hour about a curve with some radius. Okay, so the question is, it has a coefficient of friction of 0.35. That's pretty standard. You know, it's not it's not like super rainy or snowy or whatever. It's pretty standard. Uh, and this thing is going around the corner. The minimum radius required to keep the car from sliding when traveling around the curve is most nearly. So what's the, the, the question also says there's no super elevation. Super elevation is like the banking, right? So if you have this car going around, you have the, 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 the road banked. To kind of help it help with the additional friction there's no banking it's flat so what's the minimum curve radius that we're going to use here well let's let's take a look what forces do we have this is where it's a little weird like and honestly it's it's kind of weird in the sense that this thing's moving right so it's it's this vehicle's moving but it's kind of getting pulled in if you will right it's getting pulled in by a, it's centripetal acceleration. I mean, it's it's this this curvilinear acceleration that's going on, and but basically we get some centripetal force that's that's kind of having to hold this thing in, which is going to equal our friction. So the friction is is going to be what's holding it there essentially, uh, and keeping it in on the curve, right? And if the the friction is exceeded, it's going to slide off the road. Okay, so what we know is there's kind of this like this this centripetal force or a normal uh or a normal you know normal force that's kind of pulling you know pulling in on this thing and that force it, it, we're going to call is going to be like fc equals um mv squared over r do you remember that one do you remember that one i mean like if we come back to the manual here for a second or the reference handbook right it's it, it it sort of shows up in here and uh, I think uh, is it is it here or is it on the next page uh, where did it go oh actually let me just go back there for a second because there's our uh, there's our parallel axis theorem right IC plus MD squared right that distance is the I maybe I should have written it as the distance squared rather than the length squared that probably would have made more sense the the IC plus the MD squared okay uh, where does it tell us what distance? It doesn't define that distance here, but it's that distance from um, the center of the part to the center of rotation that we want. Okay, so that kind of goes back to the last question. Uh, but let's keep coming back here for a second. And what do I have? I have, uh, I'm looking for one piece in here that tells me about, uh, one more, one more, is it one more? It's a couple more. Okay, here we go. Normal and tangential kinetics for planar problems. So we have a plane problem here. Um, we've got this normal force mass times acceleration. What do we have? We have the velocity squared divided by rho, which is kind of the radius of curvature. So that's where our mv squared over r term comes from. And, and this is kind of that normal force that's kind of like pulling it in that has to equal our friction as well. Okay, so this is going to be kind of where we start is that mv squared over our term so what do we have we have a mass of a thousand kilograms right times our velocity of can I leave it in 90 kilometers an hour probably not let's just convert it we already did that the last time 90 kilometers per hour is going to equal 25 meters per second so we're going to say 25 uh, meters per second squared divided by some radius we don't know what the radius is but what we do know is that that centripetal force has to equal our friction force. Because if it's bigger than our friction force, if we need, you know, if we need more to maintain that curve, in other words, if we need more normal force to maintain that curve, then our radius is going to have to get bigger. Okay, so what we're going to say is our force of friction equals mu times n, right? So what do we have here? Well, we know that this is uh, 0 0.35. That's the that's the coefficient of friction that we're given uh, times our normal force, which is going to be 1,000 
kilograms times 9.81 meters per second squared. So if friction, uh, let me just write it this way. If, you know, if the force, of, the centripetal force has to equal our force of friction for this thing not to go off the road, we can just set these two things equal to each other and make it work. So we're gonna have 1,000 kilograms times 25 uh, meters per second, um, 25 meters per second squared uh, divided by R equals 0 0.35 times and, and the reason I'm writing this out is because I want you to see something else I want I want, I want you to see that this uh, 9.81 meters per second squared and what do you notice is on both sides we have uh, we have mass so on both sides we have this 1,000 kilograms 1,000 kilograms and it's gonna go away actually so uh, if we kinda do our cross multiplication here we're gonna get R equal to what 25 squared divided by all of this so so what am i going to get i'm going to 25 uh 25 squared divided by 0.35 uh divided by 9.81 i'm going to get a a radius of about 182 meters okay so it, it's not uh, this question honestly this is a probably a legit question that you could see on the test where it's like it's not it's it's not super super crazy but you have to recognize that if that force that you have to maintain to keep this thing going around that curve is bigger than your friction force then you're gonna need a bigger radius to make it work right it, it, but it also just gets into that idea of the, the basic friction equation the basic kind of centripetal force or normal force equation here mv squared over r and they use the rho um, that rho is, is kind of a, a curvature uh, in itself. So we are going to take this and I'm going to highlight the uh, 182 uh, meters as our answer. Okay, so a couple questions left here. Let's keep going. So question seven. Oh man, I had somebody ask me this question, a similar question like this. I, and I, I've done different block friction block plane questions actually I, it wasn't this exact question they were doing a review somewhere and they came across a question that was like this they're like Matson, i'm never going to see this on the fe am i and i was like i don't know it seems kind of kind of a little bit over the top but in the same token i was like i like the question i really do i want to i want to deal with it uh, honestly this is one of those questions that if you if you look up you'll see on like ap physics you know so if you it, it, this doesn't even get into like crazy dynamics it's just like ap physics it's like friction on block on a plane but it's thinking about it just brings in a lot of cool things that i wanted to i wanted to i don't know take a look at so i'm using this as a, an acceleration type problem but it, i'm also bringing in, into that constant acceleration piece you know defined to solve for time and this question is kind of neat it's we've got two blocks right block a and we'll make block A green today and block B and you'll notice that block B is bigger than block A okay block B has a mass of 20 kilograms and block A only has a mass of 10 kilograms okay so there's a coefficient of friction of mu equals 0 0.3 okay and what else we have our, our angle of 15 and uh, what else do we have we have a frictionless pin so we don't have to worry about mass moment or inertia or anything in this pin and if the blocks are released from rest the time it takes in seconds for block B to make contact with the surface is most nearly so this is kind of the the question already sets that up I mean I could have said well well which way will the blocks move right and, and you could figure that out but, but in this question we're gonna try to figure out how long it's gonna take for B to hit the ground okay that's it. How far? How long it's going to take for B to drop one meter? So let's draw some good free body diagrams. So that's you know FBDs. This is this is going to be a good approach to most of your questions here. But let's draw some free body diagrams. I'm going to start with block A. Okay, so I got block A on a plane here. Okay, and what am I going to do with block A? I'm going to color it in because I don't know what else to do. Uh, and I'm just confused by this question, but that's okay. I'm, I'm not really that confused by it, but let's think about it for a second. What do we know for block A? We've got some force of A that's, you know, pulling this thing down, or essentially the, the, that's, that's going to be what? Force of A is going to be 10 kilograms times G, right? That's just going to be equal to 
um, 10 kilograms times G, right? That's, that's just our force going down. But let's think about this for a second, because normally if we get a block on a plane, I'm going to, I'm going to rotate my axis. So the X is this way. Well, if X is that way, now I'm a little bit worried because now I have to think about components of this force and I'm going to have, well, I'm going to have F a X and I'm going to have F a Y. And why do I care? I care because I'm also going to have some normal force. This is going to be my normal force, which is aligned at that 15 degree angle. Okay. And what else am I going to have? I'm going to have some friction force. And if I know that this thing is kind of moving, right, I've got some tension pulling this thing up, right? We've got this, this constant tension, uh, you know, pulling on this thing then the friction force has to resist that and I'm going to draw my friction force in this direction. Make sense, right? Friction resists movement. So I'm putting the friction force resisting the way the tension is pulling the ropes wanting to pull this thing up, the friction is going to try to hold it back. Okay, so that's that's one thing, but okay, so so you'll notice I have a plural FBDs here. So what else do we need? Well, let's take a look at block B, right? So if I take a look at block B, right this is block B and again I'm just gonna color it in while I think about this for a second but what do I have block B isn't isn't super crazy block B essentially I've got some force of B which is gonna equal it equal 20 kilograms times uh, times what 20 kilograms times 9.81 meters per second squared times G okay and the only other thing that I'm going to have here is some tension uh, pulling this thing up or holding this thing up. And now I'm going to do something that's a little, little screwy here, but, but what do you know about A and B? What you know about A and B is they're attached by a rope. So as much as B moves, A moves also. So if we were to lay this thing out, it's almost like 1D motion, even though it's in multiple dimensions here, right? It's, it's, it's almost like 1D motion in the sense that if we take a look at this, we're going to line up X along with this rope. I'm going to keep my X value going with the rope. Can I do that? Sure, why not? Because they're both moving in the same direction at the same acceleration. Does that make sense? They're, they both have to move in the same direction at the, not the same direction, direction, but like they're both, the directions they're moving are tied kind of to each other by this rope. If that makes sense you know as far as if this goes you know one little distance here um, this one's gonna go one distance so if this one goes you know one meter this distance here is gonna be one meter does that make a little bit of sense so it's like they're, they're both gonna um, go the same amount because they're tied together by that rope okay so I'm gonna put X in that direction and then when I do that this question is kind of cool because now what we can do is we can um, yeah we can take a look at components we could say uh, what could we say? We could say FAX equals F times what? The cosine or the sine of 15. And then there I pause and you got to pause and you got to know this. So that you got to know that this angle here is 15. So FAX is going to equal what? FAX is going to equal the sine of 15 degrees. And FAY is going to equal F times the cosine of 15 degrees. And how could you figure it out if you weren't sure? You could put into your calculator which one's going to be bigger, right? So 10 times 9.81, right? This is going to be uh, 98.1 newtons, right? 98.1, 98.1 times the cosine of 15 should be bigger than the sine of 15, right? So what we get here is we get this equal to about 94.76 you know, newtons. And for this one, uh, I'm going to get uh, I, mean, I don't think I even have that in my notes, but what am I going to get? I'm going to get 25 uh, 0.39 newtons. Okay, so again, it, it makes it makes a little bit of sense. So if you're not sure which is cosine and which is sine, that's okay. But you got to know that the y component here is going to be bigger, right? Because that 15 degrees is so small. If that 15 degrees went down to zero, the y component would be 100%, and the sine component, the the x component, would be zero. Okay, so we have this. But now this is cool because now we get to our kind of equation of equilibrium here. And you know, to we're gonna apply some of the forces equals mass times acceleration. You might be thinking, like, okay, Madsen, you got through this whole thing and, and we didn't even do that yet, but now we're going to let's look at this. Some of the forces mass times acceleration. In 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 dynamics, it doesn't equal zero. Acceleration doesn't equal zero, unfortunately. We have some acceleration. 
So we have to figure out what that is. So what is it going to be? Well, let's let's write our sum of forces. And actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this sum of forces for kind of this whole system here, right? The, I'm going to write my sum of forces for this whole system. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, what forces do I have? Okay, and they have to equal the mass times acceleration. Well, if I look and I start here, I've got, well, minus FAX, so minus FAX. What else do I have? I've got, you know, plus T. Actually, let me write this first. That, well, I'm going to write minus FF, minus the force of friction first, and then plus T. Okay, so I've got all my, my horizontal forces, FAX, I've got T, and I've got FF. Great. And then what about this one? Well, this is where you have to get a little outside the box here because remember X is in this direction. So then I'm going to say, well, I'm going to say minus T because X is going down, T is going up. I'm going to say minus T. And then I'm going to say plus uh, the FB. And what do you notice here? You notice this T kind of goes away. That's pretty cool. Uh, and then what we have to do is we have to say this is equal to the, to the mass, or, or I'm going to say the total mass, and the mass of A plus the mass of B, because we're, we're looking at this whole system together. They're both moving together, right? They're, they're tied by a string uh, or a cable, uh, times this acceleration. I'm going to say this is the total acceleration. There's going to be some vector. Uh, it's going to be like an x vector, or maybe I could, could call this the total acceleration in the x direction. OK. And this is cool because now we know basically all these pieces and we can find an acceleration. And this is where it's, it's, it's kind of cool. So FAX we said was 25.39 newtons. We know that the force of friction is going to be what? It's going to be mu or 0 0.35. Actually, let me just write it up here for a second. The force of friction equals mu times n, which equals 0 0.35. Was it 35? No, 0 0.3 times n, what's n? n is uh, FAY, so FAY is going to be times 94.76 newtons, so the force of friction, I actually don't have that out, so let me do it out, 0.3 times 94.7, uh, I get like 28.43 roughly, so it's like about 28.43. Which, interesting to note, let, let's just think about this for a second. If we have a force of friction of 28.43, and we didn't have this force, this tension force thing, would this move or would it not? So think about this for a second. Would the would block A move if, if it was disconnected from mass B? Well, if the available force of friction 28 is bigger than the, the force pushing it down the plane, so no, it wouldn't move actually if it wasn't connected. So. That's kind of cool. So then what else do we get? We get plus FB, which is, we never did that out, but we got 20 kilograms uh, times 9.81 uh, meters per second squared. This is going to equal the total mass, which is 10 kilograms plus 20 kilograms times this acceleration. And uh, when we do that, right now we just have one, e one equation, one unknown variable, and we uh, can look at this and say that we have AX is equal to, uh, good grief, um, you got to put that one into your calculator, but what do you get? Minus 25.39 minus 28.43, you know, plus 20 um, times 9.81, and divide all that by 30, and we get about an acceleration of 4.75 roughly uh, meters per second squared. Does that make sense? Does it make sense? So I think it does, because if we think about this, how, how fast would this block drop if it didn't have anything hanging off it? It would drop at 9.81 meters per second squared, the acceleration 9.81 meters per second squared. But here it has that block sort of holding it back, right? And it's gonna be less than 9.81 meters per second squared. So it makes a little bit of sense. But now we know this acceleration so what can we do with acceleration? Well, once we know a constant acceleration, this kind of brings us back to the beginning of where we started. So the constant acceleration is going to be, um, now we can find the time um, to travel one meter.
okay? So if we have a constant acceleration, this kind of brings us back to that one of those equations that where we could say, well, the distance, right, equals the acceleration times t minus t naught squared over two plus v naught times t minus t naught plus s naught, right? And this this comes from uh, those those equations for constant acceleration that we were looking at earlier. Right, but the cool thing is we know that because this was at rest, V naught zero, S naught zero, we're gonna define S naught as our as our point here. So all that we have to Okay, so I think I my uh, streaming software told me it didn't like me for a second there, but um, I think we're back, so hopefully uh, we don't get any more hiccups. So basically where I end up here, uh, where I end up here. Uh, is uh, t equals about 0 0.65 seconds okay so nothing too crazy uh, well it is kind of crazy it's that whole like physics thing that gets kind of crazy but we get 0 0.65 seconds when we're all said and done so um, hopefully that works I'm not sure how many people were losing here because I know the stream sort of cut out there for a second um, today my computer's not loving me so um, we'll see how it goes, but mass moment inertia. Yeah, it could be there John Horn man. Thanks for thinking. I'm brilliant I, I think you probably are more brilliant than me, but um, you know, we'll we'll, uh, we'll go from there so All right. Hey, let's keep going here last question and this gets into kind of goes is a, is a reprise of, of question of question five, right? So we got this thing it has some mass moment inertia. We already found the mass moment inertia is 15.4 it is on the test apparently, you know, so, you know, this, this particular equation or um, question might, might not be there, but let's take a look. We got a rod and cylinder welded together, same question, same masses, same everything. We've got the mass moment inertia now, but the assembly is released. And so now, now we release it. And basically what's going to happen is this thing is going to swing down and eventually it, it's going to, you know, start rotating and it's going to have some uh, angular velocity. Uh, that's gonna you know when it's vertical and this thing's gonna be once it's swinging it's gonna want to keep moving right so it's gonna swing and it's gonna keep swinging eventually but this is kind of like our, our time zero and now we have some time one or, or we could say you know t1 and t2 so we have two different times going on here and we want to find out the angular velocity when the assembly reaches a vertical orientation okay so what is that how do we get that and what are we going to do? Well, in order to make this work, we are going to go ahead and apply uh, conservation of energy. Okay. And my uh, my streaming software is not liking me, so I'm sorry about that. So I think we're connected again. Let's keep going. So we've got kinetic and uh, and we got one. Let's the last question. So let's keep going. So we got kinetic and potential energy, and we got to make them equal at all times, right? We're, we're basically we have zero friction in here. We have zero braking. We got zero other things going on. So we have to say that these two are going to equal. Well, the nice thing is uh, we know that the kinetic energy at the, the basically there's there's zero kinetic energy up at this point. And there, at, the, at this point, there's zero potential energy, right? So, so this is going to help us in the sense that at the first point when it's held horizontal, it's not moving and it's zero kinetic. And when it's vertical, we have we've lost all of our all of our uh, uh, potential energy, and uh, now we're going to be back to to 100% kinetic. So this kind of helps us in the sense that if if T is kinetic and, and V is potential, right? We can kind of cross some of these out. So we can cross out T here, we can cross out V here. And, and basically we're gonna say uh, the, the potential energy at point one has to equal the kinetic energy at point two. So let's find what those are. And once, they, once we find out what they are, we can go and set them equal to each other and solve. So V1, the, the potential energy is gonna essentially be the sum of like MGH. Remember that term? It's just the mass times the uh, uh, gravity, gravity acceleration times the, the height or the distance. In this case, we're going to take the distance uh, to the center of the part, right? So um, we're going to what we're going to do here is we're going to say this is going to equal 
to the mass, which if uh, we're looking at this rod here, right, we have the mass of uh, 2.5 kilograms times our gravi gravity acceleration, 9.81 uh, meters per second squared times its distance. And again, for this distance, we're gonna go from point A to kind of the center of this part. So this is gonna be 0 0.5 meters. Because that's kind of the potential of that whole mass of that thing. It's got, it's gonna rotate at that point, okay? And then what's the, what's next? Well, what's next is we're gonna to add to that, I mean, this is kind of like, this is the rod, and we're gonna to add to that the, you know, the, the cylinder. Okay, so we're gonna say the cylinder is gonna be 12 kilograms uh, times 9.81 meters per second squared uh, times uh, 1.1 meters. Okay, so what's the 1.1 meters look like? That's gonna bring us out to this point. So I think if I solve all that out, I'm gonna get like this total potential energy out here equal to about 141.75 I'm gonna use Newton meters. It's not the same thing as a moment Newton meter, so don't get confused, but it's it's a it's a measure of energy. So this is kind of the the potential, right? That all turns into kinetic. And what's our kinetic? The kinetic, if we come back to our reference handbook here and take a look and skip a couple pages down here, um, what we'll see is the kinetic uh, energy is gonna be uh, where did it go? I think it's out oh, here. It is. It's it's basically that uh, either mv squared over two or i omega squared over two, right? And here here is that i c omega squared over two, and we're going to be rotating or i q omega squared over two, where we're going to be rotating uh, about the pin here. So that's why we got our moment of inertia about the pin. So we're going to use that i omega squared over two uh, formula here, and we're going to say this kinetic energy is going to equal uh, i omega squared over 2 and I'm going to call this IA because that's about the point of rotation so we got the 15.4 kilogram uh, meter squared times our omega squared over 2 and remember what we're trying to solve for is this omega so if we set these two equal to each other you know if, if essentially V1 equals T1 I'm sorry um, T2 Right, we're gonna get uh, this 141.75 uh, newton meters is gonna equal I, which is gonna be 15.4 kilogram uh, meters squared times omega squared over two. And if we solve for omega, we should get some value here. And if I did it right, it should be one of the answers up above. So 141.75 divided by 15.4 times two and the square root of that is going to be about 4.3 radians per second. Okay, so it's it's. I mean, if you had to solve for the the uh, mass moment of inertia on this problem, definitely that would be way too much for a, a three minute FE question. But but to set you know potential energy equal to kinetic energy is probably what's gonna happen if you get a energy type of equation where you have to deal with you know this this work energy power you could get an impulse question uh, a momentum you know, conservation of momentum question as well so there's definitely like other flavors to this that you can see dynamics is a huge topic uh, especially because it's coupled with mechanical portion of it but it's if you break it down into some of these kind of bite-sized pieces i think it helps and and hopefully it'll help you to get a couple of those questions and uh, uh make you know make it help you make it through uh to pass the fe so i don't know if you guys have any other questions but uh, this is this is one of those things that i think is it's good to go through, uh, you know, I, I, and uh, hopefully that helps. So if there aren't any other crazy questions, uh, I have I've got one joke. It's it's uh, 
you know, it's, it's, I was at a, a soccer game the other day and there were some little kids and, um, they're, they're, they're just the cutest kids, you know, they're hanging out the, and you could tell they hadn't been to like many soccer games before. And all of a sudden there's a goal and there, everyone was like going crazy. And like, you know, I mean, the kids, they were like, they were, you know, probably elementary age. And so, so they knew how to read, but it was kind of funny. Everybody was kind of like all excited. A home team got a goal, you know, and uh, over on the sidelines, people held up signs, G O A L, you know, goal, 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 goal. So, it, so I, I leaned down and I hear the kid. You know, well, I don't lean down, but you know, he's like, he's shouting to his dad. He's like, hey, dad, dad, why did, who, who, who's Al? And his dad's like, what? The sign, the sign, it says go Al. So, so who knows? Maybe you need a, somebody to cheer for you when you take the FE, but uh, if, uh, if you need something, just put, Go Al on your sheet and uh, and go for it. All right, so go Al, uh, and we'll make this work. All right, but that's it. So maybe it's funny, maybe it's not, and who knows? We'll we'll go from there. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out, and hopefully the the I know we had a couple issues that we had hiccups with the stream tonight, but hopefully. Uh, the recording comes out well too. If not, we'll uh, we'll do another one. So I uh, got another one next week. And uh, if you want to join in, that'd be great to have you. And until next time, then uh, keep working hard, keep moving onward and upward.